Um, started the red line series, started telling people, hey, I'm not telling you to lock in or write the variable. All I'm telling you to do is find your red line. Yes. Find yes. your red line and figure out what's good for you. Yeah. Because then you go, then I go back and I start having, thinking about conversations I had with Dave Butler, who is somebody who, you know, uh, helped me in the beginning and mentored me, my mortgage agent. And one of the things that stuck with me was like, what allows you to sleep at night? Neil D'Souza, how you doing, brother? Doing great, bro. How are you doing? Good, man. You're looking sharp. You're always looking sharp. Thank you. You know, uh, it's like uh, fine wine, right? <laughs> Gets better with age. That's so. it. But hey, watch my size, man. I just put that thing up today. All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Let's have a drink, man. Right. You know what? I want to do this podcast with you. Oh, I think you want to do this podcast with me as well, too. Yeah. And I think what we'll do is we'll kind of just let people in on... I don't know, some of the conversations that we have Yeah. when I'm in the car, <laughs> heading up north, Yes. and we're in there, we're talking shit, we're talking about the economy, we're talking yeah. about things that are happening, good, bad, the ugly, conspiracy theories, all that shit. Yeah. All right, all so right. this is unscripted, um, nothing planned. Yeah. But I know there's one thing that you did want to talk to me about, yes. so we'll, we'll get yes. to that we'll, eventually. We'll get to that, but you know, first thing I got to tell you is, I just got my motorcycle license. I know. I saw that. Yeah. I saw that in our, in our WhatsApp group chat. <laughs> Neil, you're crazy, man. Yeah. Well, you know, just ticking off boxes, right? It's, uh, cheers. Cheers. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, you know, there's something about, um, everyone's trying to get the scorecard, but, uh, you know, the, the real scorecard is about what kind of life you live. And, uh, people ask me, what, what, what's the dream with a motorcycle? I was like, well, I don't really have one. There was one back in the day when I was, young wanting the wanting this look of having a motorcycle but now it's like you know what i want to i want to be about and you know you've heard me talk about this let's be about taking off those boxes rather because someday never comes for whatever it is you don't have to have it forever you know a year from now i may not want a motorcycle anymore right everything happens now and, and i think people yeah. forget about living in the now mm -hmm. as opposed to always worried about um, the past or things that have not happened yet, the present. Yeah. You know, I heard this saying, the, what did they say? No, the past creates depression and the future, if you think about the future too much, creates anxiety. Mm -hmm. yeah. You got to be careful of that, right? Where, hey, you want a motorcycle bike? It's like, fuck it, I'm doing it. Yeah, I get to try it out. If I like it, I like it. If I don't like it, it doesn't matter. It's an experience in life. And uh, you know, obviously I'm at a different place where it's not about ego, right? And uh, there are a number of things that when you're, when we talk about this money game, you got to know why you're doing it, mm -hmm. right? What What's the point? Now, a lot of people, they're just, you know, it's all about YOLO. You only live once and they're, they're trying to do everything and they don't care about what they're doing with their money. And so they're always going to be slaves to somebody, to a boss, right? Cause then they're never going to get enough and they're never going to have enough. And then something comes up and you know, the market changes next thing, you know, they're, they're stuck at those forces. So we're obviously not talking about that, but at the same time, there is something to delaying everything to someday, not having a plan for when you're going to do that next step. And so there's, there's something in there where we get to be mature about it. We get to measure our risks and choose when you do the the different items, you know? I mean, um, I've got, uh, next year I wanna do a race day. I, I started telling you about that. We, we go to a track and get some race cars and, you know, go out on a track, you know? <laughs> Let's and, do it, man, I'm turning 50 next year. <laughs> dude, you and me both, come on. <laughs> I just gave you my age, but I mean, yeah. it doesn't matter. What? But it's a man. It's um, a magical year. It is a magical yeah. year. And we're going rock climbing, uh, not rock climbing, mountain climbing next year too. So Yeah. And we're also yeah. working on some business ideas. Yes. Uh, you know, we won't jump too much into that, but I do know that you're going to be coming out on uh, October the 26th to talk about uh, some of the ideas that we've been flushing out. Yeah. We've been having some meetings, um, yeah. sitting down with a few key partners. Yes. And, uh, and what I love about it is it may not always be something that I thought of doing, but then I take a look at my whiteboard. And I'm like, hey, there's a hint there. Mm -hmm. There's a hint of something that I wanted to do. And then all of a sudden these things start to happen. People start to come into your lives. And you just, you sometimes you have to go with the flow. Yeah. 
still have a plan, but realize that, you know, you, you don't know where you're trying to go unless you start writing these things down. Yes. It's yes. so important to do that. Yeah. There, uh, someone was asking me about, uh, about some of this stuff and they said, how long have you been thinking about this? And I said, sometimes you got to lead people where they don't know that they need to go. Right. There has, and I know that you do that a lot. You're always helping people with real estate portfolios and that people don't always know that step because we're so caught up in life. And for those of us that are looking at those other aspects, part of our job is to lead people into those places. Nobody has to come along, but if that's part of what you've got on your whiteboard, part of what you've got in your life plan, then then there's great opportunities. And if you're looking, this is a part you and I are always talking about is where are we at in the different cycles, right? Um, money, real estate, all of these things. And, uh -huh. and we're looking at that because they present their own unique opportunities. And we're not always trying to catch the wave, right? Because good luck timing all of that stuff. But you want to be able to just watch the signs and be able to to ride with it. Yeah. Uh, you Rarely do you want to be the first, but you want to get in there. Everyone says uh, buy low, sell high, but everyone always does the exact opposite. When there's lots of hype, that's when they're getting on that hype train. Right. Right. But I mean, you can quote Warren Buffett right now. You know the, you know the saying, right? When everyone's fearful, it's when you got to be greedy. And when everyone's greedy, that's when you need to be fearful, right? Right. So. And here's the other thing that leads to another point. I actually just did a video on this just the other day where from 2020 to around the beginning of 2022. Yeah. Neil, yeah. there was no fear in the market. There was none. It was almost yeah. like it, it, it just disappeared. Everybody was Superman. Yeah. The Bank of Canada came out, made their announcements. Listen, interest rates are going to stay low until, I'm pretty sure they said 2023. Yeah. Well, they said they, a long they, time. They, they, they said, said a very long yeah. time, right? They, they actually said 2022. Did they say 2022? Yeah, yeah they said, uh, well, they said, we're going to let it run hot for longer than normal. And, uh, and we're going to let the market uh, heat up more than people. We got a fact check that. Was it 2022? I don't know why I thought it was 2023. Yeah. Anyways. Um, That's why I wasn't there was no fear. There was no fear in the marketplace. No. And now that the fear is back, yeah. this is a good time to be investing or at least be looking. Yes. At least be hunting. At least be going out there and searching. Yes. There's opportunity out there. There are people. And look, here's the unfortunate thing that, you know, there's a lot of people right now that are in variable uh, negative cash flow, we know 500, a thousand, 2000, some people who are in fixed, uh, uh, interest rates, their renewals coming up in the next month, maybe in the next six months. What do they do? Neil, yeah. what do they do? You're a mortgage agent. You, we, we do private lending. Like what, what do they do? What are your thoughts on where things are going? Let's get into this stuff. Where, where do you see things going? I think this is a good direction. Yeah. Well, well, look here, what I'm seeing is, yeah, we're we're seeing the defaults are happening and people you would never imagine i'm talking about people driving around and you know x5s and porsches and you know they're they look like they've got everything together but but everything is is falling apart in behind the scenes so you're seeing the crumblings now oh absolutely yeah absolutely i i know of situations where people where real estate gurus have started selling off their stuff. They've already been selling off their stuff because they realized that they didn't account for a change in the market. Everything was was beautiful. All, everything was rainbows and sunshine. So let's keep going. And and now the when the market changed, no one wanted to believe that interest rates were going to go up this high. I right, listen. Yeah. Let me I don't know if I've shared this story. So we're going to share because these are things that we would share in our, in, in my car and yeah. our conversations that I'd have for like an hour and a half, two hours with you. Yeah. Okay. This is real. This is a real story. So in regards to the interest rates, okay. Yes. I was at the cottage and my neighbor had come over. I was there with my brother-in-law and we were cutting down a tree. Okay. I don't have any skills to cut down trees, but anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Leave that story for another drink. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So anyways, he doesn't know much about real estate investing. He doesn't, he, you know what I mean? Like he's not an investor when it comes to investments and buying properties and all that. And I said, hey, what are you doing? This was around early September, somewhere around there. I go, what are you doing with your, with your interest rates? He goes, oh, I locked in. Like, what? What do you mean you locked in? And, he, and so I'm listening to these experts. I'm listening to people who are like, you know, don't lock in. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, if you do, only do one year. Uh, interest rates are going to come back down next summer. Don't like, and that's the yeah. thing when you're, when you're listening to experts and economists and man, most of the time they get this thing wrong. Yeah. Half the time, right, wrong, whatever. Okay. Yeah. So I'm driving home. And I'm like, what? How come this guy's locking in? This guy's not listening to the people that I'm listening to, all these experts, and they're saying, you know, you shouldn't lock in. Just to write out the variable. It's going to be fine. And then I started thinking, what if he's right? Okay. Then I go back to the beginning of COVID when everybody said the market was going to tank. Yes. What did the market do? <laughs> it took off like a rocket ship. Yeah, like all the, ship. all yeah. the experts said it's going to take off like a rocket ship. Yeah. So I called Darlene up. I'm like, Dar, you know what? We got to sit down. We got to take a look at our portfolio. I think we should lock in. And she's like, I don't know if we should lock in. I'm like, I know I get it. I understand. But I think we really should take a look at everything Mm -hmm. and really consider this. So we sat down, looked at everything, and we're like, holy shit. And I think a lot of people got caught. Holy shit, we're getting close to our red line. Yes. Hence, Yes. When the red line series came out, that's yes. when I started doing those red line that's series. Right. Yep. So we went to the bank. This is September. And I didn't want to, Neil. I did not want to do this. And we locked everything in. We're like, fuck it. We're mm-hmm. going to lock it all in. Because I couldn't afford it going any higher at that time. I'm like, yep. I can't. And, and already a couple of them had already breached the red line. Yep. So we locked everything in. And I was like, you know what? I can revisit my portfolio in five years. Some of them locked in for four, some are five. Yeah. Right? Said, so screw it. Um, started the red line series, started telling people, hey, I'm not telling you to lock in or write the variable. All I'm telling you to do is find your red line. Yes. Find yes. your red line and figure out what's good for you. Yeah. Because then you go, then I go back and I start having thinking about conversations I had with Dave Butler, who is somebody who, you know, uh, helped me in the beginning and mentored me, my mortgage agent. And one of the things that stuck with me was like, what allows you to sleep at night? Yes. And that's what I went with. Yes. And that was it. That was, yes. that's the story of the red line. Yeah. Investing is not supposed to keep you up at night. No. Right. You, you're, you're doing something wrong. If you're doing it that way, you're taking on too much risk. You don't know enough of what you need to know to be able to do that. The the whole point about taking on risk is being able to calculate it, knowing enough about it so that you can take the risk. It's the difference between possibility and probability. All sorts of things are possible. And if you don't know what the probability is, you're going to be freaking out all the time. But if you understand, well, what's the probability of that happening? Well, that's pretty low. Okay, then, then you can take your measured risk. Whereas most people, when it comes to investing, they they have no idea, like, like no idea. Somebody somewhere, some, the news program or whatever, mm-hmm. th- these guys who get paid for fear, you know, they're telling you it's been, it's done well for so long. And so you go ahead and do it. That that's the normal society way. And, and the reality is, is you got to actually know, you don't want to be staying up at night, right? Who cares if you leave a couple hundred dollars on the table per month if you get to sleep at night? Exactly. Right? So from that standpoint, I mean, what I'm, what it looks like, everything is pointing to we're going to have a really rough spring. There's a lot of people that I think should be selling their house right now because they're already under. Mm-hmm. They're already underwater. And, we're, we're, and you're talking about investors. You're talking about homeowners or both. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are people that are going to try to, because of their pride, they're going to try to hold on over the next number of months into the spring. But they're going to, I just get, let's get through Christmas and, yeah. you know, because people like to play the denial game, right? Oh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. And then it's worse than they could have ever imagined. Yeah. Right. And that procrastination is what's going to kill them. They're going to run up their credit cards. They're going to use every avenue that they have 
to to make it between now and then. And then they're going to throw it up on the market. And I think there's going to be a lot of properties that go up for sale yeah. in the new year. You've, you, you're. Well, listen, I'm not, well, I, ha- I wasn't in the listing agent before. We work yeah. with a lot of real estate investors. Yeah. I have listings now. Yeah. A lot more listings that I typically would have. I mean, look, I've, I've listed many properties over the time, but I mean, I'm, I spend more time with buyers because of the business that I'm in and working with real estate investors. Yeah. Now it, it is shifting. Yeah. I think I should also give credit to another person as well, too. I think it's important is Frank Taylor. And so I had Frank Taylor on my podcast. Uh, I'm trying to remember now when, twice now, but I think the last time was sometime in the summer of last year. And he okay. warned about this. Yeah. And he goes, Gary, get ready. He goes, get ready to have all kinds of listings. So he went through the late 80s, early 90s. And he goes, at some times, I would have 60, 70 listings. Okay, let me, let me give you the, where, where I'm coming from when I say that this is what's, what we're seeing. As on the mortgage side, we get the requests for people that are looking for money to try to get them out of the hot water that they're in now. Mm-hmm. If they get the money, they, you're know, kicking the can a little bit further up the road. Right. If they don't get the money, they're going to try to get it here, there, wherever they can. Again, the influx of deals that we're seeing for people trying to, that I'm looking at it and I'm telling them, you need to sell now. I won't do this mortgage because you need to sell now. And they don't want to do it. So when you see that kind of influx, you're like, okay, it's just a matter of time before they are so far into debt that they can't do anything. I mean, we're seeing properties right now here in GTA where people have been trying to sell and they couldn't sell. The last property I saw was one out in Brampton. It was selling earlier this year for 2.1 mil. It didn't sell. And now it's under power of sale and being sold for 1.6. It's a five hundred thousand dollar, half a million dollar bite, and that hurts. You know, and they they got to a point where they just couldn't go any further. And we're pe- more and more people are putting themselves into that position where, yeah. And and you know, and I'm glad you bring that up. So there's two things there that I want to touch on. So one is if for anybody who doesn't know, so Neil, you're a business partner of mine on Deep Pockets. Yeah, I love that you're there because you're conservative. And you also touched on a point where, look, I'm not doing this deal for you because we're not in the business of taking people's homes. Yeah, We're in the business of helping people and also saying, what's your strategy? What's your exit plan to get out of the situation yeah. uh, so that you are in a better situation or it gives you some time to set up a, a better situation? Yeah. Okay. Or helping investors. Um, the other thing there now, and I hope I don't lose my train of thought is what else are we talking about there i lost my train of thought well, there's there's three things three words that i uh just like you've got wealth health and mindset here yeah um i've got uh partnership integrity and excellence mm-hmm. and those that that's my why you know and excellence is one of those ones you never actually get to right you, you're always striving for excellence and the real estate you know, private lending, real estate, all these are these are just the mode. These are just the strategy that we use that that I use. It could be anything for that matter, but this is the avenue that allows me to create the best partnerships, have integrity, and be able to achieve excellence. That's why real estate. In and because I've got a wife and kids and you know, I I'm not into taking the level of risk that some people so you know, some people, you're not, real estate isn't your thing. I, I'm i not going to argue that point, right? It's just the one that I've found that allows me to fulfill on who I am in these areas of partnership, integrity, and excellence. Yeah. So kind of getting back to, so you, you believe that we're going to be in more trouble. Absolutely. Moving forward, come next spring. Yep. Um, let's touch on, and again, I'm not an economist, yep. right? You're not an economist, but we read a lot. I, I, we, we, we watch a lot. We don't need to be economists for us to go, hey, look at how many mortgage requests it, I'm getting. And that's what I'm Look going. at how many s- yeah. right? sales sure. listings you You don't getting. need to be. Yeah. Because yeah. your you're, you're finger's on the pulse. Yeah. You're on the front lines yep. and you're seeing it. Yep. You're seeing what's, what's actually happening. Yes. 
The other thing as well, too, when you take a look at interest rates, yes, and even though it is helping inflation come down, I was actually, I've been trying to really understand inflation. And me, you can jump in here as well, too, Neil, is there's, is there's two types of inflation. Okay. Okay. Uh, somebody that I like listening to is Lynn Alden. And she finally broke it down for me. I'm like, ah, oh, shit, I get it. Okay. Okay, I kind of understand this. C- come on, let me in. Okay. So the one type of inflation is bank lending inflation. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, which is what happened in the 1970s. So in the 1970s, the baby boomers yes. were now moving out, getting their own homes. They go to the bank, the bank lends them money, and that's part of some of the inflation. But now the Federal Reserve can now raise interest rates to combat that and uh, or, or lower the interest rates to allow the economy to continue to grow again. Yes. Okay. The other type of inflation is crisis inflation. Mm-hmm. Crisis inflation is like World War One, World War Two, COVID. Yeah. You got to print money. And so now when you print money, it creates inflation. Then you also need velocity, meaning people are spending money. And so when that's happening now, what ends up happening is that it also creates additional inflation. So when you raise rates to try to combat that crisis inflation, it also creates other inflation. Here's an example. Bank fails. What are they going to do? Print more money. Yes. Right? Um, People are having a difficult time buying groceries. Print more money. Yeah. That creates additional inflation. And this is where now you're hearing the word, if you pay attention to what you're hearing on the news, it's going to be sticky. It's going to be sticky. Sticky. It's going to be sticky. Yeah. Pay attention to the language that they use. That means there's going to be more inflation. That's what I read out of it. Mm. And based on, again, my own um, analysis and and the the people that I trust and listen to, it's, it's not going any it's not going away anytime soon. Then you also have the element of potential wars. What are you going to do for wars? Print more money. So, you know, it's, there's going to be some difficulty, I think, in the next next little while. Let, and, and so for investors, oh, and, yes, and I'll let yeah. you jump in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're going to buy now, yes. buy, make sure it, it works. And then be safe and lock it in. That's what yeah. I would do. I'm not telling you to lock in. I'm saying if I was going there and go buy an investment property today, I'd find something that works, uh, run the numbers, it looks good, I'll lock it in for five years and I'll, and I'll revisit it then. Yeah. Warren Buffett always says the same thing and he's been doing it for a long time. He's like, if it's a good business, then I don't need to worry. It, he doesn't buy things that are gonna go up, that are gonna get better if I do this, if I do that. He just buys things that perform, businesses that perform. And income properties are no different. A lot of people over the last couple of years were buying properties on the basis that it was going to. You know, if I get it up to fair market value, if I do this, if I do some renovations, then it's going to perform. And that's that's not the thought process. For him, it's always you buy something that's producing now. If it gets better, then that's great. And uh, and the same is true in income properties. If it's doing well now, then when you raise the the rental prices or any of those kind of things, you do some improvements, that adds to your, your bottom line, not the other way around. And so a lot of the people that were, oh, I'll just take a, you know, a $500 loss, monthly loss right now, because appreciation is going to... You're now betting on the market doing something. And a lot of those people are the ones that are hurting. But I, I just want to go back to something you, you, when you were talking about inflation and you were talking about the banks. Um, what is it about the banks that uh, you, you mentioned uh, the bank going under, I think you were just mentioning about, right? Well, the banks that bank failed. Failure, bank right, failure. Right, when, when they were raising the interest rates, and right. a couple, I can't remember so, the name of the banks down in the U.S. that failed. There was a couple of them. Yeah, so there, uh, there's the most, the one that was well publicized was SVB, there Silicon you go. Valley yep. Bank. Yep. Do, do you know at all wh- why they why they were failing? From my understanding, I mean, they had a lot of... Uh, I know it, but I can't remember now. Anyways, go the, ahead. The, Spit it out. This the simple answer is um, bonds. Pe- pe- yeah, people they wanted more money than they had available. Right, right. They had made these bets on the bonds that 
Right. They were going to be worth more. They ended up going down and people wanted the money and then they didn't have the money to, to redeem, essentially a run right? in the bank. Yeah, that's right. Right. And, and we've talked about this. Now con- they did bail out the, 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 not the investors. That's right. Right. But they did bail out the regular D- deposits, depositors, right? They, the FDIC took care of that. If well, you had money deposited in there, they took care of you. Right. Right. They had to because it was already starting a run on other banks. We, of course, know First Republic took a huge hit um, and a number of the smaller banks. Um, and, and you and I have talked about this topic. What, what you, what's your thoughts on fractional reserve banking? Well, fractional reserve banking is if I deposit $1, my understanding is that the banks can turn around and lend out $10. Right. Okay. Yeah. So they don't have all the money if there was, if everybody wanted to come back and get their money. Yeah. Right. Because all lent out. What, what, what's the purpose of that one, one dollar that you, you're lending out nine? What's the purpose of keeping one back? I don't know. There is no purpose of it. <laughs> right? It's a Ponzi scheme. It, it's, it's supposed to be a reserve, right? You, <laughs> yeah. You've got that. And, and so that you can take care of your normal transactions, right? With people come in Got for it. cash, that kind of stuff. Right. Of course, when they're when people have a greater requirement than what you have available, like just happened with SVB, then then you have a crisis. Is right? it still ten to one? Do you know? Well, that's a great point that I wanted to. We've been talking about fractional reserve banking, but in, in reality, we don't have fractional reserve banking. Huh? Fractional reserve banking. Uh, they they basically got rid of that in 1992. What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> <laughs> what you talking about, Willis? Yeah, so we've we've had no reserve requirement since 1992. We can fact check that. Yeah, absolutely. Go to the Bank of Canada. You can go right onto their website, and uh, they've got papers on why they removed the reserve requirement. Why? Now, of course, they. You know, most people wouldn't, most people don't know what fractional reserve banking is, much less removing the reserve requirement entirely. Listen, most people didn't even know what inflation was <laughs> until it, until it hit yeah. them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right, listen, I knew I couldn't even outpace inflation back in 2008 by having a job. Yes. Yes. Think about that. I thought inflation was way too high back then. Yeah. Okay, so they so they removed it now, so so yeah. there is no. So, so we we limit. removed the uh, fractional reserve banking. Well, in, what does that mean? And and so we have no reserve requirements anymore. But part of it is is that we actually have the system wrong. We we think that most people think that the bank lends money based on how much money you put into the bank. So when you take money and you put it in and you deposit it, the banks don't take deposits. So. When when they when you give that money in, it's actually a loan agreement. They call it a deposit, but it's actually a loan agreement to you. And where now they're going to pay you a certain interest rate for that money. They're not deposit takers, and so they take that in. But they don't need your money to be able to give out what we believe is loans, because banks don't actually don't actually create. Uh, money in that way. It's not like they're taking it and, and moving it over. Banks are in the business of um, acquiring securities. So when they do that, when they give you a mortgage, when they give you a loan on a, for a vehicle, these types of things, it's actually a contract where they're buying a security from you. And it's a principle in accounting, uh, double accounting, where they put a they put the number on their assets and they put the number on their liability simultaneously. And what, they, what they're doing is they're just creating credit. They're extending credit effectively is what they're doing. It's credit creation. They're not creating money, they're creating credit. So that's why the, that money for that mortgage shows up in your account. You take that as part of the security that's you're you're selling them that security and then you take it and you move it over to to the other bank and now you've created a million dollars 
in that process. But they're doing it through creating credit. So the banks actually don't need our deposits at all to be able to do that. And the the central banks, the Bank of Canada, their job is to try to, uh, you know, try to hold off the banks from. Otherwise, they they would just keep doing it. So that we talked about the interest rates, they have to raise and lower the interest rates. Otherwise, the the banks are a business. They would just keep creating credit in that way, especially knowing that the Bank of Canada and the government of Canada would backstop if there was ever a problem. That's wild. <laughs> like, I, mean, I don't think I even have any questions for that. <laughs> That's wild. Um, Tells you there's something I wanted to drop on you. So then what, what should people do then right now based on where we are in the economy? What's your, what's your, your advice? Okay. First of all, the, it depends on where you are at in your personal situation. In your investing career, right? right wherever you are business-wise, entrepreneur, yeah. nine to five. Yeah. Okay. Right. If you, if you don't have money to eat, then that's, you're in a different place. Now, if yeah. you can take care of that, absolutely it's the time to be investing because there are deals we've talked about this before there are just opportunities abounding all over the place you know even if you had money in the stock market right now uh you'd you'd be doing great right now because they continue to print the government of canada continues to print money right and um and so you're you're going to be good in any of those directions but the reality is right now most people don't have right so cash are they printing yes. money right now or are Absolutely. they contract? So they're still printing money, still printing. even though they say that they are in a contractional. Yes. Yeah. So, right. so we are in the contraction, right? We are in the contraction because what happens when you, when you raise interest rates is it, it's more expensive for you and I to now borrow that money. And so we can't afford to repay that. So we don't take on that loan. And, and so now because of that, the the amount of loans that are the amount of credit that the banks create they're not cre creating as much right now the banks don't want to just do it to infinity right they're they like security they care about their bottom line so they're not looking to just give money to anybody but in this market they're trying to they want to give money out but you and i won't borrow it mm -hmm. but the government will borrow it the government will keep printing money so they're continuing to do that for whatever programs, um, you know, that they want to put that towards. The, the federal government is sending money overseas. We know hundreds of millions of dollars are going overseas to support different measures, right? right. To support a war. Yep. And, and we don't have that, that kind of money being spent here. Right. So on one side, the government is printing money. On the other side, you and I are being affected by the contraction. So then how does the, uh, let's kind of switch it up a little bit. How does the BRICS play into this now? Oh. So for anybody who isn't aware of the BRICS, yeah. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Um, I've been paying attention to this now for at least four or five years. I've heard of it. Yeah. I mean, I went back and I even saw videos talking about the BRICS eight, nine, 10 years ago. Now, I really don't know when it first kind of started, but yeah. I know it's been around for a while. I know Mexico is thinking about potentially being uh, accepted into it in a couple other countries, which will be interesting because I know, I think Mexico was the largest trading partner with the US. I just saw a stat today where it's like 70% of their exports go to the US. Can you imagine now if they do become a part of the BRICS and uh, they're now open to other, a lot more other countries, like to be able to do free trade with Brazil yeah. Yeah. and Russia. And yeah. uh, what does that do to the U.S. dollar? Okay, so I'm going to take maybe an unpopular stance to you. I don't believe that the, we need to continue to maintain watching the BRICS. There's, there's no doubt they're, they're expanding. Mm -hmm. um, the part that I'm not sold on is how quickly that's going to happen. 
Right. I agree with you. Right. I don't. I don't think this is like a collapse next year. Yeah. I think these things take ten years, yes. fifteen years yes. to play out. Yeah. I think we've hit the top of the U.S. Su- superiority, and I think it's a slow decline. Mm. We we don't have a better alternative than the U.S. dollar right now. For everyone that I, I've I get on social media, people will will come after me and say, "Well, we should go back onto the gold back and these kind of things because." We want our uh, our currency to to have value, and it, that would be catastrophic for us if we were to do that. As much as I like the idea, it would be catastrophic for the vast how, majority. How long would it last for? I mean, I guess you have to take into account population, uh, how much money you need to, how much gold you need. Yeah, right. Yeah, it, it, you'll always have to. You'll always have a Richard Nixon moment. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, that was that was the reverse where they took us and, off of it. Exactly. And I guess I should explain that as well, too. So Richard Nixon essentially took us off um, the U.S. dollar off of uh, being backed by gold. Yeah. That was in 1971. And which then, if you listen to Robert Kiyosaki, that's when cash became trash. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And and we know that at a bare minimum, if the... If the Fed's goal is 2% for inflation, we know that the dollar is going to be losing value typically at around 2% per year, right? So we know that the dollar can only go in one direction. Now, because of deflations, you know, you can increase the value of a dollar, right? It can get some of its power back. Um, but but by and large, we're, what you're going to see is over those years, it's going to con- when you don't have it tied to something. It's going to continue to lose value. Yeah. So, what do we do as investors? How do we make money? We understand that the value of of these hard assets are going to continue to go. Yep, they're going to continue to increase, right? Yep. Now, you know, with private lending, we we love private lending. Why? Because money in, money out. It just keeps, you know, we just keep rolling. Yep. But there are also times where you watch what the governments of the world are doing and we watch what our government is doing. And as they continue to print money, we know that there's going to be no stop to inflation. So we want to make sure that we have some assets, some hard assets in hand, whether we're talking precious metals, whether we're talking real estate, you, you know, whether you're talking um, superconductor chips, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, you want to have some hard assets because you know that those are going to continue to go up yes but simultaneously one of the things that we're seeing right now is because of the interest rates we are seeing the hottest markets taking the heaviest hit right now because people do not have the cash they cannot borrow the money to pay those mortgages to pay the mortgages that they're going to need and so do you think there's also a double play on this here where it's like a tight squeeze to squeeze it squeeze out some of the small players to allow some of the bigger players to come in. You know where I'm going with that? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, there's there, even before that step of these big guys coming in and buying houses, because of course we know, you know, you're talking about right. the Black Rocks and Vanguards coming in and they've been buying up residential real estate left, right, and center. Yeah. Uh, and there's a real fear that they're going to have about 60% of residential homes in the States um, over the next number of years because they're quite aggressive. I don't know what the percentage is how many homes they've bought here in Canada, uh-huh. but I can tell you that it, they don't care about the foreign buyers tax or vacant home taxes. I guarantee you that, number one. Um, but before that, I think the bigger issue is how do you pay for all this money that you're creating somewhere else? You, you take it from the places where the, it's already stockpiled. And the number one place that money is stockpiled in in our Canadian economy is in the single family home. Baby boomers, house prices went up to all that. Was that really what they were worth? A million, $2 million, right? Well, if those prices come down, where does that value go? While interest rates are up, it's pushing down on all of those prices. And for everyone that says supply and demand, if there's supply and demand, why do we have so many listings? Why do we have people not being able to buy back at those prices? There are people buying, 
but we're going to find that we're going to, it has to revert back to the mean, right? We went way out of whack. Way out of whack, Neil. Right. We, we went to seven to 12 times your income. Yeah. Maybe even higher. Meanwhile, when we bought our home, we were three, two to three. You know, even if you go back to the 80s, I guess you'd probably be what, maybe two to three or one to two. I'll tell you an interesting stat. Or, or two to one, sorry. Yeah. Uh, before this government came into power, the Canadian middle class homeowner was actually richer than U.S. middle class for the first time in history. The Canadian middle class was higher than than the uh, Americans. Now, uh, you know, we are like GTA is one of the most expensive places in the world, and Canadian real estate as a whole is more expensive than anything in the states. And so, we are in a real predicament right now, where there's a there's room to go down in a lot of these places. So, why would it still be at an advantage for people to buy real estate. If you're if you're looking for the overnight success, real estate's not the place to go. But we know that if you can hold out on on properties over the next couple of years, we know that everything will smoothen out. That's just, you know, the worst will pass. But the reality is most people aren't a lot of people, sorry, not most people, a lot of people will not last out these next couple of years because they have no other source of income. They have no other way to pay for the higher uh, interest rates, the higher gas prices. I mean, we've already done, we've already had two uh, carbon taxes, fuel taxes. Uh, they're talking about another one. Um, there's been the, uh, the farmers, the taxes that have been levied on the farmers. There, you know, we've, it's gotten more and more expensive for people and there's only so much that. Yeah. That and you know have. what the thing is too, is that I think, especially when you're watching social media, a lot of people made it look very easy to do real estate investing, yeah. to quit their nine to five job, yeah. that it was that easy. It's not that easy. I want to yeah. make sure I'm very clear on this. It's not easy. With everything that's happened, I've had to revert back to a little bit more additional active income, right? Build my real estate team. Um, and also leverage the earlier skills that I had to raise capital to be able to continue to move my business forward as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. I think people, I think over the last two, two and a half years, a lot of people made it look like this was an easy game and it's not. This is the, you know, who said it best was Ross Perot that success, no, sorry, entrepreneurship lies on the razor edge of success and failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this this balance of you got to be able to know when to expand, when to pull back, when to expand again, when to pull back, where to where to grow, where not to grow. This is uh it's 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 a a challenging game, but it's fun as <laughs> hell. <laughs> yeah, but it's fun because but it's challenging. We know that look, none of us wants to lose. No, I don't want to lose. But you and I both have one thing in common is is that we could lose everything today. Mm -hmm. And you and I both know that we could build it back up tomorrow. And faster. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've learned the skills now, what I need to do, what to focus on, what I don't need to focus on. Yeah. Right? How Absolutely. to build a business. Yeah. And that that is a fundamental difference, right? So mm -hmm. even though we might be on razor's edge, um, I mean, how many entrepreneurs have gone through it where they failed and it actually allowed them to come back even better and faster. Yeah. And, and if they had stayed and not failed, they probably wouldn't have been as well off, right? Because of those changes that they made after failing. So listen, listen to even Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio talks yeah. about his failure and how his business Great went. But yeah. Yeah. And listen, anybody doesn't know who Ray Dalio is, look him up. He's got a great YouTube video. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, yes, the changing true. world order. Yeah. Phenomenal, phenomenal video. Um, <laughs> really gives you a good high level macro view yeah. of what is actually happening in the world today. Yeah. It's going to be a little scary for a lot of people to watch. Yeah. That. But it's important yeah. though. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I'd rather be scared than not scared. I'd rather know. I, I like to terrify myself. <laughs> yeah. 
you know? And so, yeah, sometimes I do go down some conspiracy rabbit holes. Yes. I want to know, yeah. I want to know. So, so then if, if it starts to happen, I'm like, oh, okay, I see what they're doing. They're taking me down this path. But yeah. I'd rather know than not know. Yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather not be blindsided. Yeah. Right. And that's the problem is a lot of people get blindsided. Yeah. Yeah. That, and it's, there's something there where people prefer to turn away. I, I don't want to look at it. Somehow it'll go away. Mm -hmm. But we know typically that that stuff doesn't go away. It actually tends to get worse. You know, and so right now, I think if people are really, if they really want to be on the ball, now's the time to get yourself together. Now's the time because it's a huge opportunity. Back in 2008, when everything crashed, yep. there was, everyone sits around, the vast majority of people sit around and go, what do I do? Right? As opposed to, that's the time to move. That's the time to. Yeah. Right? That was when I first started investing in real estate was in 2008. You know, people said I was like, Gary, why? Yeah. The market's going to crash. Actually, so here's actually even more of the crazier story. It wasn't so much that I started investing in 2008. Here is the trickier part. It was 2011, 12, 13, 14. Yes. All those years, I think people forget this is that everybody that when I was at work was saying the market's going to crash, you need to get rid of your properties. Why would you buy more properties? You're going to lose everything. You're jeopardizing your family. So fear is a good thing because it allowed me to really take a step back and analyze, am I doing the right thing? Is this the right property? Is this cash flowing? Should I lock in? If I lock in, where does my cash flow land? You know, it really helps you analyze effectively. Yeah. If I get into uh, a property and I'm going to convert it, how fast yeah. can I do this so that if I need to lock in? Like people just forgot that rates could go up. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, I ever, thought, I ever thought rates would go up this quickly, but you always have to realize that rates could go up. Yeah. Short memories. Yes. It, the, we've had this thing called a stress test for almost 10 years now. We've had this thing called a stress test where they have been warning us. Yeah. We want to stress test you just in case rates go up. Right. What did they pick as a number? 4.75 and now they've raised it to five. Why would they raise it? Why would they raise the stress test now? Okay, maybe you didn't think about what what them testing us for 4.75 meant. But now that we're seeing those that were at 4.75, why did they raise it to 5? Do you think they're done? Not at all. How much higher do you think they're going to go? Uh, I actually think they're going to go another uh, 50 base points. I think they'll, right now we're at 4.75, I think they'll go up to 5.25. God, it'll crush a lot of people. I mean, it's already crushing people now. Because because here's here's the hard part, is that people that are in a variable, it's difficult for them to now lock in because that lock-in price is so yeah. much higher Yeah, that you're almost better probably off yeah, staying seven in a and variable. A half. <laughs> Eight. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. We were okay. doing, and we were doing private lending last year at eight. So- Okay. So yes, I do think it's going to continue to go up. And this is the part. What do they say? It, if Because we know that they want to give us good news as quickly as they can. They want to be able to say, hey, look, we, you know, we invoked the Emergency Measures Act and we, everything's safe now. Right? They want to tell you as quickly as they can, whatever they've done has worked. Where, when do they start lowering the rates? Do you think it's when something breaks or do you think that they're going to wait until next summer or? Well, they're trying to get rates. Uh, they're trying to get inflation down to 2% as they measure it, right? As they measure it. And we're at what? 3.3 .3 right now. 3.3. .3. So we actually went up a little bit. Yeah. So they have to hold off. I think they wanted to raise rates last week, but they, they held off. And I think they're going to continue to watch that line. But... Everything they're saying tells me that they're not ready to, to, to say, yeah, we're done with raising rates. Otherwise, they would have said it. 
They would have said, you know what? We're at a point. But we're sometimes good. sometimes it is good to walk around with a big stick. <laughs> yeah. Right? Even though you don't use it, right. you pretend that you're going to use it. Right. Because what you're doing is you're trying to change behavior. Yes. Yes. So you don't have to use it. Like It's yes. like my dad walking around and my mom walking around with a belt. <laughs> <laughs> right we, we went it's, from, a, it's enough to hear it dragging underground that you're like oh shit <laughs> we, we went from 1.25 one and a half mm-hmm. to 4.75 how much how much bigger a stick do you need yeah right yeah no they, and, they well they used it and so i just listen to them that's i kid you not that's all i do is when they tell you what they're gonna do you listen to it and go did they give themselves any caveats any ways out of what they're saying. So then where would you invest your money right now? In like, would you buy properties with student rentals, apartment buildings? Like, Where would you well, advise your clients to park their money? Okay. I think there's a couple of, couple of things. First of all, if people don't have insurance, you, you need to have some type of insurance in place, like what do you mean? like actual life insurance. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, it's the it's really is the cheapest uh, protection out there, right? And I'm not going to get into the strategies around insurance, but it's always beneficial to have that yes. number one 100%. before you before you get into all the other stuff. Yeah. Because you never know if you like. I've got a 40 year plan now we're both turning 50. I've got another 40 years on, on what I'm looking to achieve, Mm -hmm. but I may never see those, those years. Right. So wherever you're at, you want to make sure that you've got something like that to take care of you, take care or take care of your family, your kids, that kind of stuff. I agree. Number one. Um, Now in terms of investing the next level of insurance, some may like it, some may not like it. Precious metals. Um, I wouldn't invest in precious metals. Um, what I would do is I would store some of my money in precious metals. Why? Because precious metals just keep your, uh, hold your value for your, for your currency, for your money. Um, again, not, not investing, not investing in, some people do invest in precious metals. I'm not talking about investing in precious metals. You're, you're literally just putting it into, uh, yeah that's an, another insurance play that's another insurance play right mm-hmm. yeah so you've got something aside that's in the scenario where worst case that we lose we have a whole reset year the canadian currency is gone whatever if some of those things happen you're going to be happy to have a real money to have real money and have that set aside and the government of canada recognizes it if you hold money in precious metals they recognize it as tax free, right? Because it's real money, not talking about certificates or any of that kind of stuff. But if you hold real gold and silver, they recognize that. Mm-hmm. It's literally in our laws, in our acts. Yeah. So, and just so you know, and so let me just share something real quick. So, yeah. I bought gold and silver back in like 2015. Um, and, and I did that because I was. I was scared that the U.S. dollar was going to crash and the world was going to end. This one, I was scaring myself. I went and bought in gold and silver, and it's still, I still got it. You got some depends while still, you're at it's, it. It's still, it's still sitting there, <laughs> yeah. and it's literally just an insurance play. That's it. So if, if anybody's telling you, like, you know, you got to go buy it right now, sure, go ahead, but realize it's more of an insurance That's play right. as opposed to a return on investment play. Okay. So I think if you're worried important. about CBDC and all of that stuff, right? The, you know, yeah. whatever that guy's Charles Schwab, all that, all you, that stuff. You yeah, want to yeah. have something non-digital, non-controllable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Th- That's yeah, it. Exactly. This is like when I was just starting, getting my business really rocking and rolling. I was smoking a lot of weed. I was getting really petrified <laughs> at <Yeah>. nighttime. <laughs> so I went and bought gold and silver. Yeah. Okay. Hasn't done much for it, me, but it's there. Yes. Okay. Good. Just something to sit off to the side. Again, we're talking about. Get get your house in order and so that you can go move forward and, and yeah. do the other things, right? Mm-hmm. Now, if you're if you're investing, what are the sectors we're seeing the uh that are really booming? Obviously tech is continuing to blow up. If you really want to invest and you've got no money, if you've got no money, start looking into AI without a doubt. Start learning it. Yeah. It's transforming the landscape of investing as we speak. You wanna you want to get ahead of that curve. 
all of us, including us real estate investors, we want to see that because it's going to change the game. We don't know exactly how it's going to change the game, but one of the things, the reasons that I love income properties and I love apartment buildings is because it doesn't matter how far down the road we go with, with AI and virtual reality, we always need some place to live, to keep the body. Yes. Hence and, again, why real estate is still a very important asset to have. They call them landlords because they're lords of the land. Yeah. That's why BlackRock is still trying to acquire. Yeah. Because God's not, we've said this before, God's not making any more land. Yeah. Right? Keep it. Hold Although it. Elon Musk is trying. I mean, he's yes, trying to, he is. he's trying to get us yes, to populate Mars. So, <laughs> right. So yeah. uh, real estate without a doubt. Again, real estate is slow, right? So insurance, uh, precious metals, slow. Real estate, a little bit faster, but it's slow. Then, then you can start getting into all of the other things. You can get into the stock market if you're interested in options and stuff like that. But there's no doubt, honestly, there's no doubt that if you want to make money right now, in this economy, it's to start a business, With, without a doubt, because so many people are running scared. Yeah. Now, now's the time. Exactly. <clears throat> right? And and but listen, it takes your own effort. Yeah. And and there's two things here that I want people to understand. So yeah, you're right. So it's, it's important to learn how to start a business. You know, go and look at Robert Kiyosaki's Four Quadrants. Yes. Right of employee. Um, self-employed investor and business owner and understand that. Um, the other thing in regards to real estate, I love boring real estate. I like three to 5% appreciation a year. One of the reasons why I kept on moving from Durham out to Curtis and Clarenton and Bowmanville and Newcastle and Peterborough, I, I was looking for the most boring real estate. I want steady flow. One of the other reasons why I moved to Mexico, you know, their interest rates out there are anywhere from, eight, nine to 15% to buy a property. Guess what? It makes it more difficult to get into real estate. Yeah. So then you have a nice, smooth, moving appreciation, right? You don't get these massive bubbles of yeah. ups and downs. You don't want that. Yeah. You don't want exciting real estate. You, yeah. It's boring real estate. It's the way to win the game. Yeah. It's, it's the whole rabbit turtle race, you know? Every, every realtor in Ontario is going to hate me right now. I would not touch income properties in Ontario. Mm. Uh, sorry. No, <laughs> sorry okay. to say it. So you wouldn't touch it because? Because you want boring. Do you really want to deal with a tenant that decides they don't want to pay you? And you can't do a damn thing. Mm -hmm. That's what you do student rentals. You get, you get the parents so on the hook. Get the, the, so, so student right. rentals is good. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I mean, look, yes, look, I get Even you, Airbnb you, you know what's is under attack right it now. Is, they're, it is. they're heavily under attack right now. So if, if you based your entire model off of an Airbnb structure, you're, you're in trouble there too yep. right now. Yeah. Right. So, but and, on, and, Ontario and, is really, and, and I get that too. Right. I mean, look at the end of the day, I mean, you know, I bought a condo, I'm downtown, and all of a sudden now, 60% of the condos or the other apartments beside me, they're airbnb in. and I got some guy or some girl throwing up in the hallway, and I'm like, Jesus, like, what's going on here? Of course, people are going to get upset with that, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's not a hotel business, so I get that. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not... Anyways, yes, I understand yeah. what you're saying, and, look, and so I, it's, it's, I definitely, like it's definitely under attack. Yeah, I like Airbnb. I, look, I just look... I don't try to invent anything. I'm not trying to invent everything. I'm looking at what are we, what's being offered to us? What opportunities are being offered to us? And, and the government makes it clear in terms of what, they'll give you tax advantages to go into certain areas of research. They'll give you uh, tax, um, uh, tax breaks if you invest in certain things, right? Income properties are absolutely in that. But then we're also watching government go after you know, Airbnb, they're creating licensing. They're, they're going after, um, you know, when the tribunals will not allow you, when the police will not come in and evict someone. If I go into a house and I say that I'm, uh, that I'm renting this place from them and 
I have a fictitious lease. The police won't kick you out. You got to go to the tribunal to say these people are Ill- illegally living it. When when we have gotten to that level of insanity, and you can see it now. You bring up a good point. You know, I remember when we first got into real estate investing. You had to write the best ad so that you could attract the best tenants. Yeah. You took time. I wrote a whole book on it, how to write the right ad and make it sound appealing and to imagine your family living here in this beautiful home in the family room and the kitchen has a walkout. To, that's how we used to have to write our ads, Neil, mm-hmm. so that we can get the right families because vacancy rates were higher. They were higher. They were like, you know, four or five. So you didn't want to be in that lower percentage. Now, I have a house for rent. <laughs> People just, they fucking just show up. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah, That's a problem. Yeah. You yeah. know? And so now the other problem is making sure you pick the right tenant as well, too. Right. Which is which is brutally difficult. Right. So so you can still win in the game, but you also understand yeah. have to understand what you're doing. You also want to make sure that you align yourself with the right team and the right players and the right property manager and the right contractors and the right, the right, the right, the right, the right. Yeah. Now, this is obviously very self-serving, but I think anybody can get into private lending right now. You don't have to have a lot to be able to get in this game and start making money. My kids invest their money. And we we turn it around, and then it pays for their university. How many hours did I spend on the phone with you <laughs> uh, trying to understand private lending back in, what, 2016, 2017? No. I, I don't well, remember. Well, well, we started with yeah. Deep Pockets, what, 2017? Yeah. I used to call you every time, <laughs> driving up to the car. I'm like, Neil, yeah. explain more to me. Explain more to me. You know, yeah. But, but, but yeah, it's just where I am in my investing career. Yeah. And I, and I think the the way to do it is to get some hard assets and now I've sold off a few of my hard assets yeah. and now I'm lending out my money and becoming the bank. Yeah. Look, my, my kids don't have any income properties and stuff in their portfolio, mm-hmm. but part of what I'm doing is teaching them about this, right? Hey, you could use this money and blow it and then you've got no more or you could lend it out and then use the money that comes back and then you still have the money left over. Or if you get into RSPs or RESPs, and using, utilizing those vehicles, TFSAs, to lend your money out. Those are all available for someone. Even if you have no cash, you probably still have something in, in RSPs or a Lira or something like that. Yep. So, and, and the reason that I always promote private lending heavily is because it allows people to come in at a at a very small amount for starters and with a very basic knowledge you and, can come in and get exposed to the real estate inca properties and, it's and all that very stuff. close to being passive yeah very close yeah like there i don't know if there's anything really passive but vi- that's very close to being yeah. passive yeah right you got to sign a couple documents kind of understand a little bit about the appraisal and the value and LTV and co- cross collateralization. And, yeah. you know, so there are some things yeah. you have to know, but. And, and we, we will literally help people with, with all that process, right? Right. I, I can ask you a million questions you can, and you're going to You can answer. ask all the questions or don't ask the questions, right? right. Neil, listen, um, we're at the hour mark here. I want to get closer oh. to wrapping it. I know. I want to get close. I know. We, I listen. I know we can go for like another another hour. I do. Well, here's what I do want to do. I want to wrap it up with some mindset stuff. Okay. Who are you listening to, and what are some advice that you would give people that are scared? They're watching and seeing the headlines. I know. I go on my YouTube channel, and it's all fear. I don't know if you've noticed that. Oh, yes. But it's all fear. It's, it's so crazy. I go on YouTube, like, fear, fear. Yeah. Uh, don't buy a home in the next two months. And it keeps coming up. Don't buy, the, uh, don't buy anything in the next six months. Don't do this in the next X amount. The, the market's going to crash. World War Three. World War Three. Russia. Th- it's like, holy shit. Yeah. Okay. Who are you listening to? W- what are you doing? And um, 
And what advice would you give people who are are nervous and scared? Because it's a very it's a very scary time for a lot of people. Mm. Well, I think depending on where you're at in terms of your mindset, you, I've heard, told you this before. I love the All In podcast. Um, you know, these guys are right now. They're covering a lot of stuff about the U.S. election, uh, different candidates, and stuff like that. But they're they always talk in terms of economics, especially on a world scale, how different things impact. So I love that that conversation that they have, uh, talking about where money is going, where where the money is flowing. Hey, it's not in venture capital right now. It's going over here. Hey, if you had just invested in these stocks, you you'd be doing better than you know. So they're they're talking at a very high level. Of course, I think three of them are billionaires, so they're free to just say whatever. Nobody's canceling them, right? And uh, I love that candidness that they share. But it can be a little heavy on the economic side. Um, you know, mindset Jordan Peterson. Love listening to him. Um, and uh, oh, who's the? I can't remember. He's, the name. he's also exposing a lot of pretty scary shit as well, too. Yeah, but I, but I do love him. Yeah, I think he's fen- phenomenal. Yeah, uh, I, I'd like to meet him. Yeah, <laughs> I'd yeah. like to meet him. Um, but in terms of mindset, I got to tell you, all of this stuff that I'm seeing, the scarier it gets, the uh, the more it's hyping me up, because that's like. It just shows me there's more and more. Op- the scarier it gets, the more opportunities are there, and and I'm a dangerous man in this world. <laughs> yeah, you've heard me say it. I'm a dangerous man in this world because while other people are running around scared or they're they're sitting, and they don't know what to do. We're making moves. Yeah, we're lining up certain things. We're getting ready to. To acquire more properties where we are making moves while everybody else is sitting still. It it makes you feel like you're moving at light speed. Right? And so uh I'm uh I know I mean we're look, yeah, we're talking about starting another business, we're yeah. talking about growing, I'm building a real estate team, um, I'm I'm growing this brokerage. Yeah. Um well, you know, I was and, speaking and at the conference back in back in May, right? Uh, the multifamily real estate conference. Yeah. Um, Grant Cardone was the main speaker. I was, and I got so much feedback mm-hmm. out of that conference. I I got mobbed by so many people that that it just lit me on fire. And I've been on fire all year. I'm just like, I, are you kidding me? Because the even the level of real estate education that's out there is garbage in many ways right we we've had this conversation a lot of what's talked about is is garbage and and having that mindset will defeat so much of of what you didn't know what you were doing back in 2008 i didn't know what i was doing back in 2007 you read a whole bunch of stuff and all you really had because you we didn't have the experience all we really had was uh was the mindset that Something is going to go wrong, but I'm going to keep going. Yeah. And then something went wrong. And yes, we were, we had anxiety and all of those kind of stuff. You with your deals, me with mine. And you just kept going. And we are at that point again. And for people that are ready to listen to that, you know, get excited. Don't, don't get scared. Now's the time to. Yeah. And you know what? That's a great way to end a podcast because. That's full circle. That's full circle in regards to how we started. Now. Now is the time. Now, now is the time, time to act. Yeah. Now is always live in the present. Don't worry about what happened in the past. It's gone. Learn from it. Don't look very deep into the future. Just but focus on now. Yeah. Focus on now and what you can do now to change your life because that's the present. Yeah. And they call, that's a gift. Yeah. Right, so don't get too wrapped up in it. Neil, listen, uh, enjoyed having a conversation with you. Thanks for having a drink with me. It was great. (laughs) 
And uh, if people want to learn more about who you are and what you do and some of the things that we're working on, how can they do this? And, and thanks for being here. Appreciate it. It's love great. it. Love yeah. it. Um, well, you know, you can look me up on social media, Neil D'Souza, Neil underscore D'Souza or Neil Mortgages. Yeah. And um, of course, you can find us. Um, you, you can go check out Deep Pockets. Yeah. Deep dash pockets. Deep dash pockets. Yeah. CAA and uh connect with the whole team and yeah and we'll and don't forget to check out uh, your podcast as well yes too. leadership to wealth yeah uh, great I'm podcast working on a i'm working on a whole new rebrand on that so yeah but we we'll, we'll we're still working on it so we'll we got something coming this, up. Uh, listen, man, these podcasts are a work in progress. Yeah. You see me here struggling in the beginning <laughs> and trying to get everything all set up, but I'm having fun with it. Just like everything else we do. Yeah. You take it on. You're not going to do it all right, yep. but you take it on and and then they'll call it luck after. Exactly. All right, brother. <laughs> Neil, I enjoyed it, brother. Take care. Thank you.